warned of Almighty God. Warned of God will be the subject of this lecture. You know, there is a Greek word that kre uh, mid idzo. It's it's a very special word. It's only used a very few times in the New Testament, and it it means um, a divinely intimate visit from Almighty God. That I said, did say divine. Okay. And any time this happens, he has a real special reason. And what it shows is that he controls. A lot of people don't believe, but they should because he does control. Many times when things with God's elect, they find themselves in positions. There's a reason for it. And our Father, he knows that reason. So, let's, if you would, open your Bibles to the great book of Luke. And we're going to go to Luke chapter 2. This is at the birth of Christ. But there was an old man there in the temple. And um, he was given a message. And, and this uh, Greek word, kremitizo, was utilized here in this place. It, it means um, to reveal, to command, to admonish or even for God to speak. This one word means all those things. So it's according as Father chooses to make something known to someone, which part of that he would utilize. So let's check it out if we may in verse uh, 25 of Luke chapter 2. Let's pick up on it. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, and that means uh, uh, a hearing, and the same man was just and devout, this is important, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. This word always comes with prayer. Most often when it's mentioned, it's somebody that prays to the Father. You ask the Father, you're probably going to get it. Okay. He hears. He listens. And it was revealed, and this word revealed is that word, revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. This was a message and, and a consideration from God to this devout prayer warrior that he would see Messiah before he died. And he looked forward to that. It was God's divine love that assured him, you're going to see that beautiful thing come to pass. Now, what you want to derive from this, what's the message? Well, let's go for it, okay? Verse 27. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, Verse 28, Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, 29, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Always according to God's word. Do you understand? That's important. Not man's, not someone else's, but God's word. And God had given this man personal, intimate, message, divinely inspired from Almighty God. He had no doubt whatsoever. But again, I would ask, what's the purpose? Verse 30, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. What, what is God's salvation? Jesus, Yeshua, which is to say Yahweh's Savior. He's seen he who would bring salvation into the world to you today. Here's the message. 31, which thou hast prepared before the face of all, I repeat, all people. 32, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. In other words, the purpose was to open up, to open that light of this Savior to all should it be, who should believe. Now, Understand this. A lot of people uh, think, well, does that to alleviate any anxieties or, or duties from Israel? Not at all. God forbid. 
it just simply opens up salvation to whomsoever will. But God's elect still have obligations that are written in His Word. And if you want His blessings, you want to pray and ask for that guidance that He always sends. And have that guidance when He speaks, when He leads. And He leads in many different ways. But it's always for a purpose. Well, what was the purpose here? To document that this child that was being born was the Savior of the world. And that it was for all, A-L-L, -L, all peoples that would believe upon Him would find salvation. And again, I will, I will um, emphasize or reemphasize. This does not release any of the duties of God's election as it is written in, throughout the Word of God. Example, Mark chapter 12. That, um, and 13, that you're going to witness before the spurious Messiah. It doesn't say all are going to do that. You are. His election, those that He chose before the foundations of the world, they will do that and accomplish it. And if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you're, you're it, friend. And Father loves you. Return that love. That's all He wants from you is for you to love Him. And he requests that. Let's, let's go to another place where this um, particular word is utilized. Let's go to Acts chapter 10. And we see this word used a great deal here in this uh, through Peter and Cornelius. Cornelius, of course, was a Roman. Cornelius was not an Israelite. He was part of the all, the, the Gentile. And this is to show you that God warns, chooses, uses whomever he will. That's, that's up to him. Let's go with chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea uh, called Cornelius, a centurion. He, he had quite a band under him. He, he was a high official of the band called the Italian Band of the Roman Regiment. To a devout man. I want you to... A, a very religious man, a holy man. And one that feared God. He revered God. He loved Him. With all his house. How many? All of his house. I mean, they had Bible studies there. They prayed there. The whole, not just part of the house, the whole house. And this was a Roman centurion, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. You will always find this word coming after prayer. And if you're wise, that's a word to the fish and is, a word to the wise is sufficient. That prayer to the Father, that's talking to Him. That's reasoning with Him. Uh, pleading your love and, and your problems or your blessings, whichever the case may be. Our Father loves it. He really does. It impresses Him, and He hears. But here you have this Roman centurion that He gives alms a plenty. His whole house loves God. And he prays always. Verse 3, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m. of the day, an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. Now that would get your attention, okay? That's the Holy Spirit delivering this divine message from Almighty God. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. And he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers, the, his what? His prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. God has seen this. God has noticed it. The point I want you to pick up on this is prayer. It is not an accident that prayer is always involved with this beautiful word that I mentioned to you, which means an intimate walk with God, a message from God, a touch from God, a command from God, a warning from God, a revelation from God. The word means all of those things. 
But prayer is the key, okay, with faith. Verse 5, And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. He'll give you the word. Now, do you notice, he didn't say, well, I, I'd kind of like to know first what it is he wants me to do. That's kind of typical for most people, okay? Even if it's God or an angel from God speaking, they say, well, now, wait a minute. That, that won't get you very far, my friend. When God speaks, you want to listen instead of talking and absorb and let it settle to the very center of your mind and let the love of God touch you. Verse 7, And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. That'd be his armor bearer. That's one that he trusts even in his back with his own sword. Since three of them, okay, uh, he trusts him. Verse 8, And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And meanwhile, let's pick it up back in Joppa, what God's doing there. It's very important. It has to do with this message. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. That's about midday. Okay. It's, about, it's dinner time. He's probably a little bit hungry even, okay? And I think it'll say he was here in a moment. Ten, and he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. In other words, the Holy Spirit touched him. God was dealing with this situation and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending upon him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. And you know what it's full of? Verse 12, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. This is unclean things. According to Leviticus 11.4, you're not supposed to partake of them. Okay. Verse 13, and there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, he had, he had never eaten any scavengers. What does he say? But Peter said, No, so, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. That means polluted. I just haven't been there. Don't want to start now. Uh, that's bad for your health, in other words. 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Don't you dare call it polluted. Now, a lot of people think that God cleansed the scavenger here. That's not the message at all. You don't want to miss the main message. Okay. Verse 16, This was done thrice, three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. It was always taken away. It was never left there for Peter to partake of. Okay. Why? God wouldn't allow it then what's the message? Polluted, unclean, common? 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made their inquiry of Simon's house and stood before the gate. They had inquired around town, found out where he was, and there they are, just outside the gate. 18. And called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. In other words, they're following the instructions right to the letter. 19. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Now, did he have to wonder if these three men were there for a purpose or that he did not belong? No. The Spirit actually told him, There's three here, and you need to be attentive to them. God controls when you allow it, okay? When you prayerfully allow it, when you prayerfully seek, if God's ready to use you, that is. 
20, Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing. Don't you even have the least little doubt? For I have sent them. It's okay. Now, he's not supposed to go with Gentiles. He, he, that, that wasn't, to, at this time, that wasn't acceptable. Now, I want you to bear in mind the sheet with the unclean things that was taken back up to heaven. But here, here we have this Gentile, and, and it, it went as far even that they would not, uh, you know, one, an Israelite uh, wouldn't even eat with one, you know, a Gentile. Well, they happen to be God's children, and that's the lesson God is giving here. Verse 21, Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? A question. He's asking them. 22, And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, he loves him, and of good report among all the nation." of the Jews, that's to say there of Judah there at Jerusalem, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear his words of thee. Now naturally, let's get right down to the nitty gritty. What is God telling Peter? You won't call men common. You won't call men polluted. If they love the Lord Jesus Christ, they are Christian and will be treated accordingly. Okay. Verse 23, Then called he them in, and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And um, 24, And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and your friends. He always brought his family into it. Why? Because they always studied together. They all loved each other. And they all knew and understood. But it's um, important that you note that in that verse 22, it stated, of the nation of Judah was warned from God. Not from somebody else. And this word warned is that Greek word I told you about. A special invitation by Almighty God to prearrange, to control, to warn. Very few times is it used in the Word of God. It's special when it is, and it's special here. It was God that controlled him to send for Peter. Okay. And uh, let's pick it up with uh, verse uh, 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. I mean, we, we've got a man of God here in Cornelius' eyes. 26, but Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. I, I'm not a god. I may teach God's word, but I'm just a man just like you are. Verse 27, And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. I mean, the whole clan was there, all of his kinsmen. And you know something? They loved God. There was no doubt in them. That's why God himself had warned them. Warned of God is a beautiful thing. And he always warned you. You know, a lot of times you've been warned when trouble was ahead you were not aware of, and you wondered, boy, how did I escape that? You better wake up. You know, sometimes Father arranges things. And you wonder, oh, boy, how did that happen? Well, ask him. Okay. Verse 28, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of, a, of another nation, but God has showed me, not, not somebody else, God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Period. That ended it. What was the message that, that Simon back in Luke 2 said? To be a light to the Gentiles and to be the Savior of the world. 
This word was used in both those cases. Revealed by God in Luke 2, warned of God here. God controls. And when, when you have faith and you trust, He knows and does control. And do you know something? He likes for you to tell Him you love Him and you appreciate it. He has feelings just like you do. You get lonely sometimes? Well, so does He, for good company. And that's why when you really are sincere and you love Him, you need to let Him know it. Not somebody else. Okay. Let Him know it, your Father. Talk to Him. That's what prayer is. And prayer is what gets His attention. Verse 29, Therefore come I unto you without gainsaying. I, I don't make any excuses. <clears throat> I don't dispute it. As soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore for what intent you have sent for me. He's still trying to put it together. Okay. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. He did what? He prayed. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And naturally, it was that angel, okay, the Holy Spirit. 31, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. All the times you've prayed and all the times you've helped the church and everything else, God remembers, and he loves you for it. 32, send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, uh, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. He'll, he'll tell you. Okay. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded of thee of God. Did he say, I want all that you command, Peter? No, he didn't say that. He said, I want to hear what you have to say from God. Okay. Showing that he was ready, that he was faithful, that he truly did love the Father, and he expected the Word of God. That makes a difference, that makes a change in all lives. Being the Savior, a Savior that saves, that saves lives. You know, we have lives today that are stacked on dope piles and, and misled and taken down Primrose Lane until they're stacked. But there's salvation. There's freedom. There's truth. And in that, you always hear it from Almighty God. God cares and God controls and that should strengthen your faith to know He loves you. So don't ever be shy about letting Him know that you return that love to Him. Talk to Him always. This documents that He hears when you talk. He hears your prayer. And uh, He heard Cornelius. Uh, uh, so he, he had sent for Peter then, as it said, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. In other words, if you believe God loves all of his children, he doesn't pick a person out. We may all have duties, but God expects you to take care of your duty. He doesn't respect you any more than he does anyone else for doing or accomplishing that duty. He's not a respecter of persons. It's his family. And he loves all of his family. And he expects that truth and that salvation, that anointing, to be taken to that whole family. It is true that he, he, does, he, he, he knows who he can trust, from, even from the first earth age. And he will use them, and rightfully so. That's fine. He still doesn't make something out of him special, okay? Not even Peter was special here at this time, but a good man. But he would not let Cornelius worship him. So God is not a respecter of persons. That is to say, this people, that people, this tribe, that tribe, if they love him, 
then salvation is there. Again, I want to emphasize this does not. If God calls you in as a witness against the false Messiah, this certainly does not release you from that obligation. Okay. But that in itself is love. That in itself is the touch of God. And God will use whomever He chooses. You know, after all, He used Cornelius to straighten Peter out. You understand that? He used Cornelius to teach Peter a lesson. That he could go there and be comfortable. He was in a family that probably loved God maybe more than even Peter's kin, all of them put together in one wad would. Okay. I mean, his whole house worshipped God. So they, the Holy Spirit was truly there, and what a blessing. 35, but in every nation he, has the, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him, saved, saved by Jesus Christ. The Word, what does it, 36? The Word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. Not just Lord of a few, not just Lord of this tribe and that tribe, all. The Lord of all, the Savior of all. And that is such a beautiful word. Kremitidzo is divine Intimacy with Almighty God, a message, a truth, guidance, um, could be even correction, could be a warning, could be a revelation. This word means all these things. Check it out for yourself in the Greek, uh, your Greek dictionary. Or even God to speak to you. It means all those things. You don't get any closer walk with the Father than in that word. And there you have his love for all people. He is not a respecter of persons. And if God gives you a gift, don't think it's yours, it's his. And use that gift and receive blessings. But all, I do not care who you are. Always pray. Talk to him. He hears you. And he will use you. Because not... All that many in this day, in this hour, in this time will pray to Him and, and seriously give their time and their life unto Him. Okay, let's go to the book of Hebrews just for, in, as we wind this down here. Book of Hebrews. About the eighth chapter. Chapter 8, verse 1 of the great book of Hebrews. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. You can sum it all up in this. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the, of the majesty in the heavens. In other words, Jesus Christ resurrected and sitting at the right hand of God. He's our priest forever after the order of Melchizedek the king of the just, okay, being the Hebrew word translated rather than transliterated. Verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not man. You know, Moses messed up, though he did a pretty good job. But when Christ pitched that tent, his own body, it's perfect, okay? Don't ever doubt that. It's perfect. Verse 3, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. So what did he offer? He offered himself. He was the sacrifice. The sacrifice for one and all times. That in his and through his blood you receive forgiveness of sins. 
and salvation comes to you through this one high priest that offered the greatest gift of all, his own life, okay? That is to say, self. Of course, he did not die. He resurrected instantly, returned to the Father at that three days. And not only did he return to the Father, when he returned to paradise, he preached to a lot of the people on the wrong side of the gulf, and they believed him, and he freed them. Because all the way back to Noah, they had not had the opportunity to believe upon Jesus and find salvation. While he was yet in the tomb, this is what he was doing. You can document that in First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And chapter 4 documents that he freed a bunch of them. Verse 4, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. That's to say the old law. Verse 5, Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished, there's that word, okay? Admonished. Kre mid adzu, okay? Of God. Admonished of God. Moses was. When he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. In other words, God personally. An it divine, a divine, um, Touch to Moses. You do it just like I showed you in the mount. You do it there where I gave you the law. You set up that tabernacle. Well, Moses did his best, but it wasn't perfect because a lot of people weren't saved by it, okay? But there we have that word, verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. And he was that promise. If, if you read on and make a note, if you care, 10 and 11 give you that promise where you won't have to ask your neighbor in the millennium if he knows the Lord. If he knows the Scripture, he's going to know it. But it's discipline that will be taught there. Turn with me to chapter 11 of this great book of Hebrews. Chapter 11. Verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This word evidence is proof, and substance is a confidence. It's, it's even a deed. It's a title. Faith, your faith is your title, guarantee, to find that salvation. Verse 2, For by it the elders obtained a good report. Uh, they, they, made it, they made it across. Okay? They were successful. Through faith, we understand that the worlds, translate this world as eons, ages, okay? There's not more than one world. We just have one. But this is the, there are three earth ages. And this word in the Greek is aeons, meaning time. These ages were framed by the Word of God. What were they framed by? The Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, it's difficult, even from a different dimension, if you would. For by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. And, and we learn from that. Why? Well, we know who Cain was of. And naturally, he had a ways to go. But do you know something? You want to even be careful how you judge Cain, because we've got the millennium coming. And we don't know how many and who Christ freed while he was in the tomb there, and he went back to paradise and saved some people. So you better leave judging always to God, and you just do the believing and faithing, okay? 
But um, verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. What? What did Enoch preach that pleased God? It, it isn't really written, is it? Well, yes, but a wise person knows what was going on when Enoch was translated. They were marrying and giving in marriage to the Nephilim. And Enoch was a preacher that was bringing down the gavel and teaching against accepting these hybrids, these fallen angels as mates, because it was destroying the very plan of God that each babe born innocent of woman would have an opportunity to decide for itself, because these people fell from their first habitation and are damned forever, as it is written in the great book of Jude. But Enoch was the first preacher that really came forth and taught against this mixing and Satan's interfering with God's plan by going against the marriages of the fallen angels. It is written. This is why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, that a woman should keep a veil over her head. That veil is Christ, not her hair. Because of what in verse 10? Because of the angels. Why? They're coming back. When Satan is kicked out of heaven, the fallen angels will be kicked out also. Satan's angels. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7 documents it. So, that's what Enoch preached. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. And the longer we live on this earth, the more we should learn and our wisdom should increase to whereby we don't make the same mistakes over and over and over and over. That we should do it God's way and be blessed over and over and over. And indeed, if you do do it God's way, He does bless you over and over and over with a ministry, being in a ministry, taking part, being successful by doing it His way, not man's way. Man's way will always fall short. Um, verse 6, to complete this lecture. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. In other words, what have you got to have? That's your deed, your proof. If you don't have that, sorry, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so it is that our Father continues to bless, that our Father provides, that our Father makes possible. And the reason we came here, verse 7, by faith Noah being warned of God. You got it? Warned of God. That is to say, krematizo. Okay. A divine intervention from Almighty God. Warned of God. Um, of things not seen as yet. I mean, it wasn't raining. Moved with fear, prepared, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he commend, condemned uh, the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. In other words, when God warned him, it wasn't raining, and he went out and started sowing. He went out and started building, in a dry land even, an ark. Now, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of laughter about that. And I'm sure that Noah was mocked because of that. But God said it. God warned him intimately to be prepared. And, Moses, and Noah never doubted. He got that ark together. Now, let me tell you something. We've got a flood coming again. Okay, It's a bad one. It's really a bad one. 
You can read of it in Revelation chapter 12 in the closing verses. It's a flood of lies from Satan. And do you know how long it lasts? Five months, the same amount of time that it lasted during Noah's time, that flood. Only this is not a flood of water. This is a flood of lies and deception. And your Father has warned you that it is coming. So you want to be prepared mentally, spiritually, and physically to follow God's Word and let God command. Let God lead. Let God warn. Let God admonish. When He has to admonish you, always kiss the paddle and get going. Okay? And, and get it straight. And when He speaks, many times He speaks through His Word. But the thing that triggers all this to our Father is prayer. Okay? You can't con Him but you have to pour your heart to Him, meaning it, to let Him know you love Him and that you want to follow Him and that you're His vessel. Wherever He can use you, use you. You're ready, willing, and able for that that you can. And that that He says you can, you can cut it. Because you know what? You're can-do type people. We get it done. That's the way it is. Heavenly Father, Thank you, Father, for the privilege again of serving you, Father. Be with us this day. We heed the warning. We take the command. And we thank you, Father, for all warnings that lead, guide, and take us through the maze of the end times and bring us to thy throne. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen.